Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on Hindu philosophy, which was begun all the way back in early 2019, but which really has not had any new videos added to it for over three years now. In response to a patron's request to resume that series, I looked back through some old books on the topic, which I had acquired all the way back in early 2019 when the original series was being produced, um, but which have simply sat on the shelf for the past few years, waiting to be re revisited. And in the course of uh, looking over the materials that I had available, I determined that the best place for us to rebegin this series would be with a meditation on the Gita, but not yet with a reading of the text itself, which is rather inaccessible to the first-time reader, especially one who does not speak Sanskrit, and especially one who uh, comes from a Western background with lots of presuppositions about religion and mythology that uh, really come more maybe from Christianity or Greek mythology rather than from Hindu philosophy itself. For that reason, we're going to begin with a commentary on the Gita and uh, specifically a popular-ish book called My Gita by Devdut Patinaik before moving on to more quote-unquote scholarly works on the, that topic. This will be the first of two lectures over Devdut Patinaik's My Gita, which is divided into 18 chapters for reasons we'll see um, in very soon here. Um, and we, in this first lecture, we'll cover um, the first nine out of those 18 chapters. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So we're beginning today with a meditation on the Gita, but you may not know that that actually is not a standalone text. Rather, the Bhagavad Gita is a part of the great and very long Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata. In fact, I think the Mahabharata very well might be the longest epic poem ever written. If you see the whole thing for sale in a bookstore here in India, it's volumes long, it's enormous. And the Gita is a part of that story. And um, the story itself is something you have to have at least some understanding of to understand the philosophical ideas communicated within the Gita. Now, obviously, we can't talk too much about so long an epic as the Mahabharata in this video introducing the Gita, but um, we should still acknowledge that the Gita itself occurs in the part of that story in which um, Lord Krishna and um, the warrior Arjuna are waiting to fight a battle within a war which is actually being fought within the same families, being fought over a piece of land, which seems like a rather silly reason for people who had known and, in fact, loved one another to get ready to kill each other. And um, as they're waiting to fight, Arjuna expresses hesitancy at just that idea. His problem, we must bear in mind, is not with violence um, for the modern ideology of pacifism, which you hear a lot about um, in recent weeks alongside um, uh, changes of mind of people who used to oppose the idea of the United States being the world's place, but suddenly they're more interested in that, even though they, you know, claim to be pacifists not that long ago. But uh, with this one exception um, not counting, we still have this idea in modernity that all violence whatsoever is immoral, and even the violence of a soldier in war on the battlefield to defend his people in their interest is basically um, something which, uh, in, in the ideal moral scenario, would not exist. Well, that's really not the context which the ancient warrior Arjuna is uh, working from, because he has killed before in battle. He knew, however, that that was not unethical, because the people he was fighting were um, basically just anonymous enemies, and they were so anonymous to him that he could um, dismiss them as so radically other as to basically be dehumanized. Fighting against his own family, however, um, would seem initially to Arjuna himself to be a violation of the ethical code, but the real problem here that that Lord Krishna brings to his attention is that the exact opposite would be the case, ironically enough, um, refusing 
to fight them in battle is what would be unethical. For this reason, you may recall that um, Julius Evola had also referenced the Gita multiple times in that uh, collection of essays known as the Metaphysics of War, which we covered in the School for Bin text just last year. And Evola um, brought up this text, I think, because um, as much as this idea would offend against uh, modern politically correct and pacifist sensibilities, which you're sort of indoctrinated through the so-called educational system to um, believe despite the um, inherent contradictions entailed there. Um, well, the um, idea of having to fight as your ethical duty, even if it's against people you already had known and had loved in the past, this offers a very valuable glimpse into the world of tradition, and that is why I think this is a great text to sort of resume the series with. But of course, actually reading the text of the Gita poses some major challenges to such a reader. For one, the very idea of reading the whole text linearly in, you know, uh, one uh, sitting cover to cover, that's really a modern anachronism, which does not apply to this ancient text because um, traditionally a guru would only read a small part of the text, um, such as one single verse, and uh, he would read it out loud and then explicate it publicly. This text um, is not meant to be read in one single sitting cover to cover like a modern book would because it does not even have that kind of a linear structure. There's a repetition and, um, you know, themes are kind of, I don't know if scattered around different places is the right word, but that's kind of how it will look to um, the first-time reader, and it also presupposes a familiarity with the Vedic texts. In fact, um, the author of this guide claims that um, Krishna's words in the Gita really do contain the essence of that Vedic knowledge. But more complicated still is the fact that um, the discourse in the epic itself actually is not a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, as you might have heard. Instead, the words which we have in the text itself are a transmission of the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, but um, communicated from a distance through the ability of someone named Sanjaya to see things happening very far away. Um, and he does this at the request of a blind king named Dhritarashtra, and I apologize, of course, for my inevitable mispronunciation of many Indian names and terms within this video, but once again, this is not so much me teaching you as it is a matter of us learning together about a very interesting and worthwhile topic. Well, Devdut Patanayak notes the irony that while Sanjaya has the infinite sight to be able to transmit what is happening on a distant battlefield to the king who is asked him for a news update in real time, um, he doesn't actually have any authority. While on the other hand, the king who has enough authority to summon this message to be delivered on demand has no sight, after all, he's literally blind. Where then do you and I fit into so complicated a network of communication as this? Well, one thing which we must consider is that um, despite having the infinite sight, the character Sanjaya does not actually understand what he transmits. He simply repeats the words that other people are saying. But that is exactly what Devdut Patanayak does not want to do in his own book, which is admittedly about somebody else's book. He wants instead to understand rather than simply transmit the message of the Gita. How though can anyone hope to understand the kind of truth contained in Lord Krishna's message? Well, we must bear in mind that in Hindu philosophy, understanding does not fall into the kind of strict binary of truth and falsity um, characteristic of Western epistemological models. Instead, in Hinduism, truth is seen as quantitative. Everyone can get a slice of that truth, however small that slice might be. Quite fittingly, the word which um, Devdut uh, translates into slice is originally in the Sanskrit bhaga. So the one who grasps all of the slices of the truth is quite literally Bhagavan. So the Bhagavad Gita is, in a certain sense, about just that topic. In addition, one 19th century Bengali mystic noted that the theme of the Gita can be found simply through reversing the order of the word itself from Gita, which means song, to Tyagi, which means in Sanskrit, the one who lets go. 
Interestingly, when I just flipped open my own Sanskrit copy of the text, I randomly landed on a page containing exactly that word, or rather, a variation on it, uh, chakt va, to be more specific. So this is a major theme of the text itself, almost to the point that um, one either coincidentally finds it on the first opening, or perhaps there are no coincidences, but I'll leave that to another discussion. The question remains, though, what exactly it is that one has to let go of. Well, although the Gita has stereotypically been seen as a book about self-realization, that's kind of maybe the Western cliché about the Gita, this particular emphasis on self implies that it would be concerned with the kind of ascetic individual who, in that particular historical context, would be living the hermit lifestyle. This is something that led to the formation of Hindu monasteries in the vastly distant past here in India. However, this emphasis on the individual hermit and his self-realization is at odds with the Mahabharata's emphasis on a war, let's keep in mind, within a family, or better yet, a war within a household. We must bear in mind that in ancient Indian historical context, a hermit is someone who, by definition, has withdrawn from the duties of householding. In the Gita itself, however, Krishna describes the body as a city with nine gates. You have, for example, um, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, etc. Basically, um, nine openings to the outside world. Um, but one might remember that because Hindu temples, as I see often on the streets here in India, um, feature statues or icons of both the god and his goddess wife at the entrance to the temple, um, this pair of bodies brings the number of gates from nine all the way up to 18. It is not a coincidence, then, that the Gita itself contains 18 sections, in line with the 18 books of the epic about a war unfolding over the span of 18 days involving 18 families. Similarly, this guide to the Gita will contain 18 chapters, but will be arranged thematically rather than linearly. The first of these chapters is titled You and I Do Not Have to Judge and is a meditation over the narratological theme of Arjuna's despair at having to fight against his own family members. This really stems from an underlying problem of a certain confusion over judgment, that is to say he does not know how he is supposed to properly judge the situation he has found himself thrown into, and judgment would seem to be so important a theme in all religions because, as a Westerner, you know that the judgment day is so important in, say, Christianity as to be the very end of all time. Once you have the ultimate judgment, everybody goes to their final destination of either heaven or hell, and at that point time ceases to be, for it is no longer even possible for time to continue unfolding. Well, you might be surprised to learn that in Hinduism there is no judgment day, because there is no end of time. In fact, Krishna is able to have a superior analysis of the situation on the ground level, precisely because he does not judge it. He simply explains the architecture of the world and also of the human subject while examining the events of the war objectively. In contrast, Arjuna's anxiety over the war really stems from his uncertainty regarding where exactly the boundary between self and other is to be drawn. Before, this was something he didn't have to explicitly problematize because he tended to fight against anonymous warriors he had never met before who always already lay over the border separating self and other. Those people were fundamentally other. He didn't have to make them so. But now he feels that the border separating self and other has to be redrawn to include a lot of people he used to call his own family and friends. At the same time, the uh, blind king Dhritarashtra, who has requested news from the battlefield, performs a similar act of judging, despite not being able to literally see, in that he draws an arbitrary boundary separating self and other when he asks at the very beginning of the text, um, what is going on between my sons and the Pandavas? 
Um, the reader, of course, knows that the Pandavas are also his family. Those people are his nephews, but he intentionally excludes them by referring to them in impersonal terms because he has already cast them to the other side of the border for which um, the self is on one side and the other is on the other side. He can maintain such an arbitrary boundary because um, the bad memories of how these people had wronged him in the past lead him to continue holding a grudge in the present and well into the future. In contrast, Arjuna withholds from drawing any particular border because his own um, mind has not been tainted by such pathological distortions. Therefore, he's already practicing something like the Sanskrit notion of a darshan, which is a, an observation which transcends the separation of self and other. This perception without judgment, in which the world is revealed, but without the kind of arbitrary boundaries or categorizations, which inevitably lead one to see a collection of objects which are sorted into the fundamental sets of good things and bad things, as of course Jordan Peterson confirmed through modern psychology. Um, well, this is exactly what Arjuna does not do. And because he suspends that sort of judgment, that is what makes him worthy to hear the message of the Gita from Krishna. Because Darshan presents the world as a fluid movement in which consequences follow from causes, rather than view the world as a collection of so many separate objects which are inevitably sorted out into positive and negative valuations, stemming of course only from one's own pathological prejudices which predispose one to dismiss some while privileging others. As a result, whereas the world of judgment can only see one's own desires because of its overemphasis on the separated eye, the world of unbiased observation allows all desires and all fears to be disclosed within a moving, interconnected whole of causes and consequences. At this point, the Gita itself really begins. It is not a coincidence, then, that in the second chapter of um, both the Gita itself and um, this guide to the Gita, the spiritual topic of reincarnation is discussed as just such an example of what one will be able to see if one suspends such pathological value judgments. Here we learn that the very need to draw any border stems from the mortal body and the mortal body's own insecurities regarding its survival needs, which, no matter how long they might be satisfied, will still inevitably end in death, because the mortal body is smart enough to realize that the end is still going to be death, no matter how successful it might be in the short term at um, overcoming uh, hurdles on uh, standing between it and its desires. Um, the mortal body fails to realize all too often that it itself is not the full story. For what inhabits that same mortal body is the immortal thing, which really cannot be translated into Western spiritual or religious or mythological terms, because if you try to call it the soul or the spirit or the psyche, you're not really going to understand what the original Sanskrit term, the Atma, really is. The Atma is immortal because it experiences rebirth many times in many different vessels, rather than be immortal in the Christian sense of inhabiting one body for a short amount of time before ultimately going to heaven or hell. Because the Atma is repeatedly incarnated, if you will, in many different vessels, it has no need in and of itself to draw the kind of boundaries which inspire um, the kind of pathological distortions of one's vision, because those boundaries are inspired ultimately by the fear and the anxiety of the mortal body which knows that it's going to die and knows that it needs things on a material level to continue surviving in order to put off that moment. The immortal resident, in contrast, realizes the deeper spiritual truth that um, the end of the mortal body, which once again is inevitable, is not the end of everything. In fact, it is not even the end of it itself. 
The memological shape that captures that truth is the circle, for the immortal Atma has no absolute beginning in birth and no absolute end in death. It is instead a circle that both repeats as a recurring cycle through many incarnations and many bodies, and also preserves the continuity of the ultimate circle of time, which also has no beginning and no end. You might keep in mind that the view of um, history espoused by Julius Evola is one in which you have the ages of, you know, the Golden Age, the, uh, the Silver Age, etc., ending in the Kali Yuga or the Dark Age, but that itself is not the end. You have the cycle itself simply restart after a certain amount of time. But because reincarnation is a concept which is so very other to Western and monotheistic thought, we would be better off simply maintaining the Sanskrit vocabulary wherever possible, rather than try to translate it into some English term which might actually make it more difficult for us to understand what is going on. Therefore, we will call the immortal resident the Dehi, and the many mortal bodies which it might occupy the Deha. You might be reminded in our group reading of Julius Evola's Hermetic Tradition a few months back, um, he claimed in the fifth chapter of that book about alchemy that the alchemical teaching of immanence reveals that um, the power of the infinite which one seeks out actually is already within oneself. This is um, a teaching which he claims can also be found within the biblical fragment, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Well, this is something you also basically find within Hindu philosophy, and with that context restored, we can now see exactly what the source of Arjuna's confusion is. He is trapped in the outer world and has forgotten the inner world, but what exactly is in the inner world that he has forgotten at that moment, yet still continues to influence him? Well, you might be surprised to know that this mismatch which he has at that moment, if you can call it that, between um, the infinite Dehi and the finite Deha is something which if he did um, try to overcome it, he would realize that the things on the inner realm which he has forgotten um, are not just, say, memories of things that happened within the life he is living at that moment. Rather, included among these forgotten inner thoughts are things that happened or memories from his previous lives. They continue to exert a great influence over the present moment and hold a significance which would ironically make things at the present moment make more sense if I saw how they relate to those things in the past, and therefore what Freud was trying to talk about with the unconscious actually is really, I dare say, a Hindu idea, but is much uh, closer to the truth in the Hindu version precisely because it is not limited to the concerns of sex. After all, sexual desire is just another concern of the mortal body. Well, in the text of the Gita itself, from chapter 8, um, verse 16 to verse 26, Krishna tells Arjuna that at the dawn of Brahma's creation, all of the forms of objectively meaningful essences, if we might dare to use that Aristotelian term now, um, they burst forth, okay, and they endure for some time, but at the dusk of their worldly deaths, they too return to a type of formlessness which is much more primordial than whatever Aristotelian form they might have been known by during their lifetime. This is a meditation on the relationship between creation and destruction, which I think you could also find instantiated in mythological forms in stories like the following. You have the uh, recurring story within Hindu mythology of Lord Brahma creating the first woman and then falling in love with his own creation and then trying to use his powers of creation to try to satisfy that desire. In one version of the myth, the female uh, tries to run away from him and transforms into a cow. In response, he transforms into a bull. He's meeting shape for shape. She then transforms into a nanny goat, and he turns into a billy goat. Then into a, um, a uh, sow, and he turns into a boar pig, and then a ewe and a ram, and so forth. You get all of the forms of creation, but they are temporary, because that is not the end of the story. In another version of this myth, um, Lord Brahma... Um, uh, falls in love with the woman he has created, who then tries to escape 
his lustful gaze by moving to the side of him where she would no longer be visible to him. In response, he uh, creates another face on the right side of his head which can see her. She moves then behind him and he responds by creating another face on the back of his head which can see her and then finally creating that fourth face on the left side of his um, head before he suddenly finds a sword chop off his creation that he had used for such malicious purposes when Lord Shiva, the god of destruction, comes in with a sword to show the contingency of whatever created form might endure for a short amount of time by showing that the, the deeper truth is that of the kind of formlessness associated with him. Well, I think that uh, Krishna really is talking about the same sort of idea here. And such an emphasis on the contingency of created form within time, I think, is particularly important when you're dealing with uh, something which is by definition immortal and actually has been incarnated in many different forms over time. Often in the Puranic myths of this phase of ancient Hinduism, somebody who seems to be a victim when viewed from the perspective of their present life is revealed actually to be a villain when viewed from the perspective of his or her past lives. For example, the Mahabharata tells the story of a guy who seems to be an object of pity within the battle, but actually turns out to be, I guess, um, living out the consequences of his own actions in past lives which were not good. Even the Mahabharata itself as a whole basically opens with the story of a king who married a mysterious, a beautiful, basically goddess named Ganga, who um, made him promise that she, uh, he would never call into question any of her actions before they married, only for him to find later that that meant he could not protest if she decided to drown their children. She does that, um, drowning every one of their first seven children in the river Ganga, before finally he reaches the point of having had enough of it when the eighth child is born, and tries to stop her from drowning that one, only to find that she actually had agreed to liberate eight angels who had been sent into this life as a punishment for the things that had happened up there in heaven. So her act of drowning those people who had been incarnated in this earth as a punishment actually was as ethical as Abraham's agreement to sacrifice his son Isaac in the book of Genesis. Similarly in the Gita, because Krishna can see that bigger picture, including all those past lives, he understands what those caught in the moment-by-moment -moment unfolding of events in this life inevitably misunderstand. Above all, he understands that the only thing which can break that cycle of rebirths is a darshan, or the kind of seeing without judgment which breaks down the illusory barrier between the self and the other that we mentioned earlier. Well, what's the big difference between the two? The difference really is that one caught up in the natural attitude suffers because he or she tries to change the world while someone who performs darshan instead shifts perspective to see a world that is always changing. This is a world that is in motion, rather than a world composed of a collection of so many objects which will once again be pathologically sorted into the categories of good and bad things in line with one's own prejudices really stemming from one's own desires. Ironically, the problem with such valuations that assign the labels of good or bad to a given object is precisely that this is not the end of the story, for what appears to be a finite process is really an infinite loop, in which desire creates judgment, which creates boundaries, which creates anxiety over those boundaries, which creates anger over the violation of those prohibitions, which leads to bad actions which keep one from realizing those same desires. Because one's desires are not satisfied, this leads to more anxiety, more anger, and more bad acts. This is also a type of cycle in that the memological shape which allows you to see what's going on there is um, the uh, circle. But this is a circle one has to escape from through Darshan, and ironically, a circle one can only escape through realizing the essence of the true or good circle, which is the circle of time that does not have any beginning or any end. 
In the third chapter, titled You and I Experience Life Differently, the author explains why through first clarifying how all life forms experience the same world which we inhabit, but in a very different way. The traditional Hindu fourfold division of the world includes the world of the basic elements, basically the um, ancient Greek elements plus the sky is a fifth, um, and then the division of um, plants, and then animals, and then humans, in a way that will seem quite familiar to the Western philosophy student who has studied Aristotle's work on the soul. In both cases, we have a certain overlapping of the abilities of each type of thing which inhabits this world, in which you have a set of concentric circles in which humans basically have the highest number of abilities. For example, elements, which um, Aristotle does not even include within this hierarchy, um, are included within the um, Hindu uh, fourfold uh, division of things inhabiting this world because elements are able to do certain things within the world. For example, they can undergo changes. They do not, however, actually experience the world in the proper sense of the term precisely because they lack desire. You might think of the example of a burning fire. Well, it will certainly take more fuel and grow if it's given that fuel from somewhere else, but it's unable to actively seek out more fuel because it is not able to desire and it is not able to act. And therefore, if it runs out of fuel, it simply disappears. It does not struggle to continue surviving beyond that limit. The Sanskrit term for such lifeless basic elements is ah-jiva, with that ah basically uh, forming the same sort of negative prefix as you find with words like atheist to somebody who doesn't believe in God, right? So um, this is to be contrasted with the living or sa-jiva, such as plants, animals, and humans. These actively desire to stay alive, and they use their living abilities to seek out the things which will satisfy those desires. Plants, for example, respond to changes in sunlight, water, and the change of seasons because these are the things that they depend upon for survival. However, they lack the ability for locomotion, which animals have, as well as the abilities for emotion and intelligence, which at varying levels of advancedness, animals also have. With this established, we can see that humans simply are animals, but ones with particularly well-developed or advanced emotional and intelligent abilities. But really, the defining feature which makes humans unique among things within the world is their imagination. One might recall that Aristotle emphasized logos or language by um, designating the human as the animal that is able to speak, um, but Hindu philosophy instead emphasizes the imagination because of its ability to posit a world which does not exist and then to contrast that hypothetical world with the one that actually does. That hypothetical world, of course, is the one which one's desires have created because it is the world in which all of the things one desires have been obtained. It is the world, hypothetically, in which my desires are satisfied. Ultimately, this culminates in an imagined world where even death itself does not exist. This is the promise, really, of many religions and even of the secular pseudo-religion of Ray Kurzweil. Keep in mind that the promise of super-intelligent computers is that they'll be smart enough to figure out how we humans will never die. This ability to imagine or conceptualize things that are not actually experienced on an empirical level leads each person in turn to experience the same empirical contents differently because of the unique hermeneutical interpretation which each person's imaginative faculties will bring to the same object. Well, that might be the way that we humans uh, experience, but what about Lord Krishna? In the Gita, he is called God, but that is for the very specific reason that he experiences all the slices of reality, those of the basic elements, those of plants, those of animals and those of humans, because he experiences all of them. He is quite literally Bhagavan. In the Vedanta, the status of the imagination is explicated through the understanding of the body as a set of containers. The outermost container of which the body is composed is the flesh, and it is through the container of the flesh that sensory reality comes to be experienced. Within it, however, is the container of thoughts, and deeper still, the container of beliefs, 
And then finally, the container of emotions. Only humans, according to this theory, have beliefs because these beliefs shape our emotions, which in turn shape our thoughts, which in turn shape our sensory experience of the world, even on a brute empirical level, rather than work the other way around. In Western philosophy, this influence of belief over the other levels of experience is called hermeneutics, which is indeed the one thing that makes humans different from both lower animals and from artificially intelligent robots. This is not to say, however, that the imagination has no role in the supposedly objective work of science, for modern mathematics is fully dependent on two fully imaginary concepts which had originated in India long ago precisely because of the influence of Hindu philosophy. The number zero, for example, has no objective correlate outside of the imagination, yet the practical results of modern technology would not be possible without it. However, as Oswald Spengler noted himself, the very concept of a number zero had to have already arisen within a culture that had the religious concept of nirvana, which was, of course, the Indian culture. Similarly, the imaginary number infinity, which is necessary for the mathematical work of modern technology, also had to have arisen within a culture that had the properly religious notion of the kind of limitlessness or formlessness which you only really get if you understand the relation between Shiva and Brahma in the myths that I just mentioned a little uh, earlier in this lecture. This book notes that when we apply the idea of limitlessness to ourselves, we realize that we actually do have limitless possibilities. Realizing that fact should cause us to change our view of everything, including ourselves. But what really is the limitless which is discovered after shattering all of the illusory boundaries of judgment? Well, we have a word for that. That limitless thing, if you will, is God, as Krishna speaks of himself in this way in the Gita and promises Arjuna that he too can lift him up from the ocean of recurring death if he will only immerse his mind in him. In the fourth chapter titled You and I Seek Meaning, we return to the distinction between the immortal Dehi and the mortal Deha, but must first ask what exactly the Dehi is, despite the fact that we already know from having to use the Sanskrit term that it cannot be translated into any readily available modern English term or any Western philosophical or religious concept. Well, we have to clarify once again that the Dehi is not the soul of Platonism or Christianity, because a soul is fully individualized, but the Dehi is not. The Dehi is, in fact, that which is universal, and that which unites us with other things which only seem to be separated from us because of the pathologically biased perspective of the individualized body of the Deha. This supremely unwestern idea has traditionally been visualized th metaphorically through the image of a spoked wheel, in which, as the author says himself, the Atma within us, or the Jiva Atma, radiates like the spoke of a wheel and connects with the Para Atma within everyone around us. All of this together constitutes Param Atma, or the potential that everyone, including us, can realize. For this reason, the Gita describes the mysterious Atma through the natural metaphor of an ocean that is fed by many rivers but never overflows. This certainly is not the soul of Platonism or Christianity because it is not just limited to humans. In fact, it can be found in everything around us, even rocks and streams which would seem to be inanimate and devoid of any sort of spiritual uh, significance, let alone this sort of participation in the infinite. What this really means is that in Hinduism, everything has meaning. In the fifth chapter, titled You and I Have to Face Consequences, 
We move on to talking about those consequences in Hindu philosophy through the familiar, if not often misunderstood, notion of karma. This is a word that is halfway understood in the West as the idea that a bad action by you will cause a bad reaction for you later on. But what does this really mean in its proper Hindu context? Well, the first thing that the author says is that Hinduism realizes that if desire exists, violence already inevitably exists, no matter how saintly anyone might be. This is because even the hermit has to eat to survive, and even if he eats a purely vegan diet, that will still entail taking the life of some other living thing. This is not something we should try to get away from, for it is inevitable because the deha is always already caught up in a cycle of fear, hunger, violence, and consequences, but the immortal Dehi is not. The Dehi has no desires, and therefore commits no violence. Because it has no desire, and no anxiety over those desires, it draws no boundaries, and therefore passes no judgment over a cycle of violence which it can simply observe. The living body, which is caught up in that cycle, cannot break free because of the problem of time. This is more specifically the fact in Hinduism that each moment is the fruit of past actions, or in Sanskrit, karma phala, but is also the seed of future actions, or karma bija. Consequences don't just happen and then disappear afterwards in a single unit of time. Rather, those actions create the conditions which later distort the actions that follow them, which in turn continues a cycle that had begun much earlier and will continue much further into the future. But wait a minute here. Who are we to say whether a given action that is bad will lead to bad consequences unless we perform the same sort of boundary drawing and judgment which we had already identified as a type of ignorance that only traps us in the same cycle we are trying to escape? Well, in the Gita itself, Arjuna justifies his hesitancy to fight on grounds that the consequence of allowing a war within a family will lead to a dystopian future in which anarchy breaks out because no boundary will be respected anymore, not even the boundary within a given household. Well, Krishna calls out that presumption by warning him just how difficult it is for anyone to interpret whether a given action is good or bad, not only in itself, but even more so in terms of its consequences into the far future. Just remember that in the Ramayana, Sita was kidnapped by Ravana because she tried to perform a good deed by feeding a hermit. It's hard to say whether that act of feeding the hermit was bad because it led to her being kidnapped and then of course a major war followed with all the suffering that, that entails, or whether the act in itself was good as far as she was concerned because she had pure intentions, it was just somebody else who made the bad consequences follow from it. But of course, we know that the situation is a good deal more complicated than that because a lot of other events in the Ramayana had already led up to that moment long before it occurred, which had laid the groundwork for such an event to take place. You could ultimately lay the blame on Ram's father, who uh, made agreements with another wife to make uh, her son the heir to his throne, which led to Ram's exile in the forest in the first place. Eventually, however, one realizes that one has to simply suspend all such judgments based on valuations. One can no longer assign good and bad labels to specific objects, for only one who ceases to assign blame in so straightforward a manner as that can actually understand karma. For that person will understand the truth of a sea of ever-flowing consequences, rather than the illusion of a collection of individualized humans, some of whom are seen to be innocent, while others are seen to be guilty. In the sixth chapter, titled You and I Can Empathize, we learn that Dharma is the first word spoken in the Gita, but what does that actually mean? Once again, Dharma is a term which we cannot translate, but that does not mean that we cannot understand it. At its most basic level, we can say that Dharma is appropriate conduct. 
The question in the Gita is, of course, whether killing one's own family members in battle is appropriate or inappropriate action. For this reason, it is customary to translate the term dharma as righteousness, but this leads to translations of the Gita which reflect the Western religious idea of judgment and of the perspective of God as savior, which actually are not appropriate in the original Hindu context for reasons we have already gone over in great length. How then should we translate these ideas? Well, Dharma means different things in different religions. It means something in Jainism, in Buddhism, and Hinduism that is unique to each one of those religions. But what we can say is that in Hinduism, it is perhaps best understood as the realization of one's potential. It is the act of changing oneself to be the best version of oneself that one can possibly be. But what does that really mean except allowing imagination to conceptualize an alternative reality that would be preferable to the one which we actually inhabit? Use that same power of imagination, though, to expand beyond your own perspective to include that of another person. And suddenly, dharma means empathy, which is the exact opposite of the kind of moralistic judgment implied by the mistranslations of this idea. We now see that ah dharma, or the negation of dharma, is just the failure to empathize with the other in that way. This choice is exactly what makes humans human, since plants are incapable, fundamentally, of extending their concern beyond their own individualized survival. Animals, too, tend to be quite self-interested simply on the basis of what their instinct had hardwired them to do. So the faculty which allows humans to be ethical is exactly this ability to imagine oneself into another person's perspective. Because doing that will not land you in a neutral space of observation, but will instead allow you to feel another person's anxiety, fear, and desire. In wild nature, in contrast, this sort of ethical empathy is not something that really is possible because the law of nature simply is that a bigger fish will eat a smaller fish. This act of eating that smaller fish cannot be criti criticized as immoral because the predator is simply following the instinct it had been hardwired to have in order to meet the survival need of getting enough food. And the smaller fish, which is eaten by the bigger fish, had probably made it that far within life precisely because it had done the same thing to other animals smaller than itself before it met the same fate. In the seventh chapter titled, You and I Can Exchange, we realize that because empathy allows me to imagine your needs, the next logical step is that I can respond by creating an arrangement in which I perform some work to meet your needs while you perform some work in exchange to meet my needs. The end result of that is a complex social ecosystem in which every person finds some role to benefit the whole of society and to be benefited from it in turn. One might be reminded of Aristotle's idea that both ethics and politics make up the practical sciences because whereas ethics deals with the individual's pursuit of the good, politics deals with the whole society's pursuit of the good. One of these ideas, in other words, naturally follows from the other, both in Western and also in Hindu philosophy. In Sanskrit, the term yagna refers to the ritual establishing such a proper social relation for mutual benefit. The understanding of karma, then, is precisely that one's action is a smaller part of an exchange with the other. This exchange made possible by yagna therefore becomes the basis which allows the rise of culture or sanskriti as the term used by the author himself because the ethical foundation allowing society to obtain order and stability will have been established at that point. Ironically, Krishna justifies Arjuna's participation in the war on precisely these grounds, for he tells Arjuna to think not of his own anxieties regarding the war, but instead to think of others' needs, which he is fighting for the sake of. What seems to be supremely unethical, then, actually turns out to be his ethical duty, precisely through expanding his perspective to include those others. In the eighth chapter, titled You and I Withdraw in Fear, the author meditates on the passages of the Gita that deal with this problem of withdrawal from such ethical connections. Ironically, the term yoga 
literally refers to connecting, but also functions as a term for this process of discovering the source of one's own failure to connect with the outside in such an ethical manner. As a process, yoga entails a movement through the aforementioned containers of the self. This allows one to pass through the deha in order to discover the dehi, or the immortal resident of the vehicle. In fact, each one of the 18 chapters of the Gita contains the word yoga somewhere in the title. But what does that word really mean? Well, in astrology, yoga refers to the favorable alignment of the stars, and there's also an etymological relation to the yoking of a horse to a chariot. In nature, living and non-living things are drawn into connections with one another by the sheer power of impersonal natural forces. We differ, however, by being able to use yoga to understand those natural forces, as well as their influence, without, however, be being carried away by them. Ironically, the perspective of yoga allows us to see that Arjuna's refusal to fight may avoid struggle in the outer realm, but it does nothing to resolve the underlying struggles in the inner realm. This analysis of action qua yagna is therefore only meaningful if it is combined with the introspection of yoga, for the latter allows one to discover the intangible emotions which underlie the more easily visible actions unfolding on the outside. How, though, do we come to be disconnected except through the disturbances in the mind which often result from painful or discomforting memories of things past rather than of experiences actually gone, uh, undergone at that moment. One thing which Sadhguru continues to repeatedly bring up in his popular writings on Hindu philosophy is that the greatest suffering is created by your own thoughts about what did or what could happen, rather than what actually is happening. Yet even if we consciously realize that we are the ones creating our own suffering, we still somehow can't stop it without first adapting the right method. That method is yoga, or the restoration of connection through the systematic halting of such inner disturbances resulting in a view of the outside defined by the equilibrium of recognizing others' fears and desires, rather than allowing one's own fears and desires to distort one's view of the whole. In the ninth chapter, titled You and I Hesitate to Trust, he notes that deva and asura are Sanskrit terms usually translated as gods and demons, respectively, but in the Gita, Krishna uses these terms very differently. He uses them to refer to people who either accept the Atma or who don't. The latter are consumed by the illusion that only that which is quantified numerically or linguistified in a straightforward literal notation is real, while the former acknowledge the value of metaphor for disclosing spiritual truth. At this point, we cannot help but be reminded of Graham Harmon's lengthy meditations on just this topic in his object-oriented ontology which ironically argues that the object can only take center stage if we first accept the metaphorical nature of the way that it presents itself to us. Only those who believe in the infinite within themselves can have only hope of acquiring freedom, because no matter how many materialistic accomplishments one might pile up, arguably through making use of the powers of numerical quantification and straightforward literal notation through, say, modern technology, that in itself will never actually lead one to become free. Krishna explicitly says in the Gita that the Asura's suffering does not stem from its failure to have its desires met, especially on a material level. For the greatest irony about desire is that feeding it with materialistic inputs does not lead to satisfaction. It only ever leads to the creation of even more desires, which will be just as poorly satisfied as the materialistic riches pile up in the background. How much truer is this today in the era of a so-called universal consumer class spanning basically the entire world, also leading to unprecedented rates of antidepressant use? There seems to be a problem here in which the only way to break free from that cycle is through yoga, which would allow one to observe without the kind of judgment that predisposes one to seek out a desired outcome, which will ironically make one less satisfied precisely if one gets it, in which case one will only end up being carried away by an even greater desire, which will try to make up for the first one's failure to meet expectations.
Lord Krishna says himself that yoga will allow you to perform without expectation in much the same way that darshan allows you to observe without judgment. This will conclude the first lecture and the first nine chapters as well as introductory material of this text. We will move on to the second lecture to the final nine chapters. Thank you for watching.